Good morning. It is so good to see all of you here. Oh my goodness, it is really great to see all of you here. We have some special people with us today. Um, I, I, I saw John and Crystal walk in and I thought I didn't work hard enough on this sermon. <laughs> so, so anyway, y'all just give me grace and um, it's, it has, the first part of the week was still full of sick and then the last part of the week got filled with church stuff and it's just been a busy week. But you know what? The Holy Spirit has been here with us and we are going, to, he, he's going to make my feeble words very special. Somehow, he always comes through for me. I know that there are a few people that have an announcement, and I'd like to recognize Lamar as our SPPR charge personnel. <clears throat> being so kind and so loving all the time. It, it really is such a privilege to serve y'all and I know I haven't really done that much this year from January 12th on but uh, it's going to get better. It's going to get better. Um, and I think Ken has an announcement. He's bringing show and tell. Yeah. The first, <laughs> first of all, the Lord thank you in our prayer by keeping that one here. I'm just thrilled to hear that. That's a answer to a lot of prayers going up. Thank you know, this is a pivotal time for all of us, for the Methodist Church, for all God's children around the world. And in our annual study, which interestingly, uh, 20 to 38 people online and in person have been a part of that week by week. We still invite everybody possible to come to that. In addition, there's been a lot of people watching uh, after the fact, after David posts it. So it's running from like 87 to 69 or so, people watching. So we want to kind of take a step forward as a church, and we're going to have a movie night, not this Tuesday, but May 9th. Tuesday night, May 9th, from 6.30 till 8 p.m., we're going to show the movie Monumental that Kirk Cameron produced and directed. We chose that night because that's the night the Flynn's were available. <laughs> and they really, really want to be here, the whole Flynn family, and invite other people. And there's some other churches in the area that are very interested in coming. So this may fill up pretty good, which is wonderful. But the story of this incredible, forgotten American treasure that has the formula built within it, sculpted, literally, of how this country is supposed to be operating, how we're supposed to be living as believers, <laughs> in this country. And so Cindy and I have created um, a brochure and we'll hand these out for you guys today. We'll also email it so that you can see it. But it's got the movie information and the cover of the movie um, um, so that we can send this to friends and family and invite everybody to come here. May 9th, 6.30 to 8 p.m. It's free for us. And we'll set it all up here in the church. And so we just invite everybody to make that, put that on the May 9th, Tuesday Thank you. Are there any other announcements this morning? <clears throat> we want to, we talked about this last Sunday, before I mentioned it. We want to remember our friends at Freedom Christian Worship Center. Our spring uh, collection of uh, offerings for their food. project 
do that, and we would like to do it um, maybe through mid-May, uh, if that would be um, acceptable to everyone. Are you pondering that? Mm -hmm. This this is April 30th. Why don't we go to the end of May? Give give us a little a few more weeks. And I know Mother's Day comes right in kind of the middle of that, so we'll honor our mothers. Yeah, everybody can give a donation in honor of mom. Thank you. Um, and I'm going to repeat that because when I was listening to y'all last week, I knew you were talking and I figured that's what you were saying, but really couldn't understand. Uh, Donna has, for years, before I ever got here, she and Mac started a, a relationship with uh, a, one of our sister churches in Rockwell. They have a Christian, they're the Freedom Christian Church, and they have a food pantry, and they are open on Wednesday mornings from 8 to 9. They're just a small church. However, 12. what did I say, 8 to 9? 8 to 12. Eight, and that's what I wrote down was 12. 8 to 12, and um, they serve a lot of people, and they run out of food. And so we try to, twice a year, get a collection because they can get more food from Charlotte than we can buy with the money that we give, if that makes sense. So for, for our friends that are so faithful online, if you would like to help with this mission product, product, project, it's going to be a long morning, um, you can just send your gift to Gold Hill and in the memo, Put uh, food pantry, be the simplest thing, and Bill will know what to do with that money. And send that to uh, Gold Hill Methodist Church, Post Office Box 52, Highway 52, and the zip code is 28071. And we, we really appreciate it. I know sometimes we do get outside checks. Have we set a goal? I think we got $500 last time. Uh, so, so I'm... It's 600, okay. I'm going to set a goal for 500, and if we go over it, then I'm going on vacation. I'll just take the extra and, and take it. I'm just kidding. So $500 will be our goal, uh, and we will collect till the end of May. Of course, if we get a check on June the 1st, Bill will still send it to the pantry. Uh, any time of the year that you want to help the pantry. It doesn't have to be one of these two seasons that we're collecting. Uh, they can always use the help at, at, at any time. And, and we always, we do appreciate all of you out there listening that, that are so faithful to us and, and do help with, with our mission projects. Um, I do personally have a little announcement that I want to make. Um, when church is over and I say the benediction, I'm not going to walk to the back and you're not going to go anywhere. I'm going to ask you just to sit back down. I do have just about two, I need you for about two minutes and because I think John's probably going to want the pulpit by 11 o'clock. But uh, I just, I just, we just need two, five minutes maybe, just a few minutes. So we'll have a brief meeting after church. Um, and I think that is all that I've got. Hoppy, an update on Hoppy. Um, I, I, the last that I have heard from Vivian is Thursday. Has anybody heard from her since Thursday? <clears throat> so, and, and Carolyn talked with her also. I had this pulled up. I really was prepared for this. Uh, so the last message that I got from her was that they, uh, the MRI did not show any new stroke activity and they're clearing him for, re for rehab. And I think that they're waiting, they're just waiting on insurance approval for that. And he's going to autumn care, is that correct? So we think he's going to autumn care. And if I hear different, I'll send out an email or a message and let you know. Um, I'm sure that they would appreciate cards and text. Hoppy doesn't have, but you can text Vivian and, and she'll get the message to him also. We had a prayer request in our prayer box this morning that this is, you all know these are my favorite kind of prayers. Uh, pray that everyone gets to know Jesus. Love, Max. Is that, am I reading it Max or did Mac put that in there? It is an X, Max. So if anybody knows Mac, Max, oh my gracious, um, 
Maybe somebody needs to come and do my sermon for me today. So we will remember to love Jesus because Max loves Jesus. Are there any other prayer requests? Praise reports? Well, I'm, I'm thankful that I'm just vertical and, and that you're all here. And uh, we are going to have a wonderful morning with the Lord. And I'm just so excited to get started on worship. And if there is no other announcements or prayer requested, if you will stand and open your hymn books to page 349. While you're doing that, I just lied to you right here in the pulpit. I do have another announcement. If you get down to that last hymn in your bulletin, it is incorrect. It is page 154, but if you forget, uh, our, our organist here who always takes care of my stupid mistakes, she fixed that for us. So the board's correct, the bulletin is not. And I think the door is open. Somebody back there wants to go check the front, the outside door. It looks like it to me. different scriptures. Our first scripture is coming from Isaiah chapter 7, and I will be reading verse 14. Therefore the Lord, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child and shall bear a son and shall name him Emmanuel, and he shall eat curds and honey by the time he knows how to refuse the evil. And, and I skipped a line there. Let me just start over. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a son. Look, the young woman is with child and shall bear a son and shall name him Emmanuel. And my second scripture is from Matthew um, chapter 1, verse 23. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. And then back to Isaiah um, chapter 53. And I don't know where. There it is. Uh, I will be reading verses 3 through 5. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from the other hides their faces, he was despised, and we held him of no account. Surely he was born of our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken and struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole. And by his bruised he, bruises, we are all healed. And my next scripture is from Luke chapter 24. And I will be reading 6 through 7. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and to be crucified and on the third day rise again. And then backtracking back to Luke 1 in verse 31. Now I'm going to tell you all who I'm talking about. And you will conceive in your womb and bear a son and you will name him Jesus. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. 
<clears throat> oh, holy God, as we take these weeks to remember why we believe, to remember who we are, to remember where it all began, open up our hearts, open up our minds. Even if it's a story we've heard all of our life, make it fall afresh on our hearts and souls. Let us feel that strange warmness that, Martin, that John Wesley felt in Asbury when he finally believed. Let us remember that moment that we turned from the world and we turned toward you. Father, too many of our churches are trying to look like the world and it is so heartbreaking. We have forgotten the simple creed that we say every Sunday. We have, I have good friends that no longer believe every word and it breaks my heart. So Father, I ask you, we are all believers. We have no doubts. We stand on the word of God. We stand on the holy rock of Christ. And I ask you, Father, to forgive us when we try to be a little more worldly than we should. Help us to stay in the center of your will so that we don't get lost and distracted by the ways of the world. Help us, God, to remember to come to you in prayer, to remember to share our needs with our brothers and sisters because we know, God, that you are always more willing to hear us than we are to pray. And we need to be more willing to come to you on our knees. We need to use this altar, this precious altar that was built 175 years ago for people to pour out their hearts to you. Lord, let us, let us go back to the moment where we were so full of passion for you that nobody could have ever placed a doubt in our heart. Let us be that Christian today. And Father, I ask you to forgive us. We have all sinned this week. We have all probably sinned this morning before we ever even walked in this church. We ask you, Father, to help us to be in continual repentance so we can have a continual clean heart. For those prayer requests that we can only share with you, we ask that you hear us right now. We lift up John, who is, is adapting to a new way of life right now. We lift up Hoppy, who is also going to be in a care facility and, and starting a new life. We lift up Shirley and Glenna, that, that they know that we love them and remember them. We lift up the whole Hopkins and Yelton family because being the caretaker is really hard. It is sometimes harder than being the patient. I lift up, Father, all, all the hurts and the sicknesses that are in this village. I lift up all the persons that have addictions that they can't seem to walk away from. I lift up everyone that's struggling to make ends meet at the end of the month and, and thank you for the opportunity of the Freedom Christian Church where we can be a part of stretching that paycheck to the end of the month. I lift up, Father, the least and the lost and the last. And I ask you to give each of us an opportunity this week to either 
ease their burden or to at least recognize and, and be able to pray for them or pray with them. There are so many hurting people just within a stone's throw from us right now that need to understand the powerful words of this creed that we base our faith on. And now, Father, we take a moment to lift up those, those prayer requests and those pleas of forgiveness in this moment. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, we come together to worship and praise and lift up your holy name. And, and our call to worship, it, it, it is, it is a, a, a call, it's a plea. It, 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 I, I beg you sometimes, you know, I just want to see your face. And, and help us to all this week turn our eyes on you and not turn our eyes on the world. And as brothers and sisters in Christ, we come together to pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we Ushers would come forward.
you pray with me and for me? Father, may the words of my mouth and may the thoughts in our heart be pure and acceptable to your sight. Amen. I believe in Jesus. I believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and was born of the Virgin Mary. Amen. Amen. This Apostles' Creed has been a touchstone for me since I was just a little girl growing up in the church. When things didn't quite make sense or they were upside down or things were changing, when world values were depleting and becoming more lax and, and these words always proved to be true and never changing. As one that grew up in the 60s and the 70s, I think that most of us lived through the beginning of the problems that we're seeing in society today. We were those hippies, or at least some of us were wannabe hippies, that wanted to just stick it to the man. We came to church on Sunday, but during the week we had a different agenda. We wanted to remove every senator's son that was getting out of Vietnam free. Remember Ohio, the, the four that got killed? I mean, that's the time we grew up in. We were rebels. We, 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 we wanted to change the world. We were the ones that screamed love, not war. We wanted Vietnam to end. And we were the ones that moved. I, I can't believe John's here today. This is literally written in my script. We moved in the 60s and 70s from moonshine to LSD. And then some of us grew up, and we got married, and we had children, and then we grew up a little bit more. Sadly, some of our friends didn't grow up so much, and so there another generation of confusion came along, and another generation of rebellious children came along. But with all of that rebellion that was going on, the decline of church attendance from the 50s has not done anything but go down. And, and children would go off to college, you know, and get so smart, and when they came home, they didn't need church anymore, so they didn't come back. And the reason that they gave was because the church was full of hypocrites, because that just sounded so much more intellectually true than the church is full of sinners, which is really what they were saying is the church is full of sinners, and I don't need to go to be with sinners to love Jesus. Me and Jesus, we got our thing. I don't need that church. So from changing the word sinner to hypocrite, it just gave them a little more clout. It gave them a little bit more validity to drop out of the institutional church. And so we find ourselves today a few generations beyond those hippies that we all wanted to be. Some of us were. Uh, I was not. I was, the one, I was in the wannabe group. Um, but when we were screaming, make love and not war, Martin Luther King was teaching us to love one another. And hearts... Hearts started changing in the 70s. They really did. We went through civil rights in the 60s, and we went from, from all white schools and all black schools to everybody was together. Hearts were changing. And we started to truly love and accept one another, like, like these hymns in our hymn book tell us to do, like Jesus told us to love one another. He didn't say love people that look like you. He said love the world. And among all the persons that we met, we started embracing that. We started embracing the words of Jesus and John Wesley and Martin Luther King and Billy Graham. And it was good. We became the first Jesus freak. Who's ever been called a Jesus freak? 
Yeah, and, and that word, that word was supposed to be a bad word. It was, that was a slanderous word. If you were called a Jesus freak because those who were not Jesus freaks didn't really like what we were doing. Right, John? They didn't, they didn't like it. So they thought that they could make us feel bad by calling us Jesus freaks. But I just kind of wore that medal and shined it up every day and just went on about my business of trying to reach one another. So, so we were the first Jesus freaks, and it was good. It was good. But it wasn't good in the eyes of Satan. He didn't like it. He didn't like it one bit. So he started taking these hearts that were embracing the words of Martin Luther King, that were holding on to the words of Christ. And Satan started twisting those words and started turning them and started pricking hearts and, and, and confusing minds. And, and, and he, he used his best tool of deceit and today, where there used to be, and, and I, I, I think all of us are old enough to remember this, where there used to be, you'd go downtown and there was a water fountain for whites only. Remember that? And, and bathrooms for whites only. And, and entrances to restaurants for whites only. Where those water fountains and bathrooms used to be, now we're seeing, and, and we got rid of all that because things were getting good. And now we see the evil of racism rising again and the carnage and the destruction that groups of people are doing that have absolutely lost their minds and need to meet a few Jesus freaks, right? In cities and towns, some of our most precious, precious ancient statues and buildings have been destroyed. And I point the finger to Satan for every bit of it. Because Jesus doesn't have anything to do with hate. Nothing. We have forgotten what once upon a time 90% of Americans believed, what their grandparents taught them. And it's real simple, and I still can't believe John's here. Jesus loves me, this I know. It just all comes down to that, right? That's what brought John back into the fold were those words that Lamar's mother told him. Jesus will always love you. And we've got this precious song we sang at my mother's funeral. Jesus loves me. This I know. Those were some of her last words to me. We have forgotten the power behind those six words. Jesus loves me. This I know. And I am standing on the rock of that power, and you can't shake me off of it. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten son, our brother, our master, our king, our best friend. When life, for me, through the years, was looking hopeless, and I would have more questions than God had answers for, these 105 words that I have memorized, just like you have, by attending church week after week, bring me back to the simplicity of our faith. It doesn't have to be hard, friends. It just doesn't have to be hard. The simple truth of love that Jesus taught, the same truth that John Wesley preached, the truth that Martin Luther King shared when he gave his famous I Have a Dream speech, and I have always held on to this one line in it, and you'll recognize it. I have a dream and, uh, that my four little children will one day live in a world where they are not judged by the color of their skin but only by the content of our, their heart. And by that, I think that Martin Luther meant the character, the love of God that they have in their heart. That that's all they'll be judged on. Wouldn't we all like to only be judged on the Jesus in our heart and not be judged on the mistakes that we make every day? And we're getting close. I believe that Jesus shared that dream with Martin Luther King. 
I believe that, that Jesus also wanted the world to judge us on the character of the Christ within us, not on our differences. He made us different so that we could be exciting. How boring would this world be if we were all exactly the same? He'd only need one of us. But he made us all different because we all bring something different to the table. So I think Jesus shared that dream with Martin Luther King Jr., but not Satan. Satan saw that we were changing, and, and, and he, he, he couldn't stand that. And I also believe that as a pastor, Martin Luther King knew and he believed in the words of the Apostles' Creed just as we do. And I think that Martin Luther King, just like Jesus, made the greatness of his faith bigger than anything the world was throwing at him. What did our Lord and Savior do the last 24 hours of his life? He never gave up his faith. His faith was much bigger than any whip that was whipping his back. His love for his father was so much stronger than any nail that put him on that cross. And his love for us is what held him on that cross. Jesus' Jesus' faith was bigger than anything that the world threw at him. 105 words that can bring peace to a wounded soul. I know this because it's brought peace to me many times. 105 words that are so easy to pull up because we've memorized it. We've said it for over 50 years. And when I'm struggling with my faith, and I don't mean whether I'm a Christian or not, or, or trying to explain to a non-believer why I am a Christian and what a Christian is, these 105 words tell the whole story from beginning to end. It tells the whole story. And these 105 words, I dare you to take the Apostles' Creed and find anything in it that there's not a scripture in here to back it up with. The Apostles' Creed came from the words of the Bible. They were not just made up by somebody long ago. These 105 words, they can change your life if you allow them to. This is week two of our sermon series through the Apostles' Creed. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. Guess what the topic is today? Last, last first one was God. Today we're talking about Jesus. Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. Jesus Christ. Who is this man that we call Jesus? Now don't misunderstand, because I'm getting ready to make a statement. That st this, I, know, I know that all began with God I, before creation, okay? I know that everything began at creation. But for a purpose of today's message, this all began with Mary and the Holy Spirit. God sent Gabriel to Nazareth to a small town in Galilee to carry a special mission to her. And she says, Hail you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you, and blessed are you among women. Fear not, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb, and you will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus. Jesus. God had foretold, I hope you notice, I know that, again, I, I make a lot of mistakes in this bulletin. It's just more of a God sheet than a rule sheet, but I've got New Testament readings. I hope you notice that I pulled a few out of Isaiah because this, this idea of Jesus didn't just pop up in the New Testament. It has been going on from the beginning of time. God has foretold this Messiah starting in Genesis as his anointed king, but also a savior. A savior that was going to come from the Israelite tribe of Judah, born from the line of King David. And both Mary and Joseph, we, they were Jews, we all know that. 
But, but, but we have to understand that both of them were descended from the line of David. Through their genealogy, Jesus could confirm that he was descended from David, the Davidic bloodline, both physically through his mother Mary and legally through his adopted father Joseph. You know, it's wonderful how, how sweet our God is and, and how he thinks of every little bitty thing. And he covered all the bases there. He brought a man and a woman who both were from the line of David. And, 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 and so it cannot be disputed where Jesus is from. And so Jesus Christ is the one that we pledge our love and our devotion to. And we pray to. And that we sing about. And, and why do we do this? Why are people still kneeling and bowing down 2,000 years after he died? When you can go out in this community and you can talk to a lot of people that don't believe in the virgin birth, they don't believe in resurrection. Heck, you can talk to some of our clergy that don't believe in the virgin birth or the resurrection. So we, for that reason, we have to keep asking this question. We have to keep asking and answering and asking and answering because of all the questions that we might have about whatever's in this book that, that, that people might pose to us on the street, none are more important than who is this Jesus. It's no exaggeration to say that, that probably that is the most central question that we can ask from the scriptures that we read in this, this book. He, he, he is the most important figure in history. And that's the most important question that anybody is ever going to face. Because in the end, everybody is going to have to deal with Jesus. Everybody in the end is going to have to deal with this man. And it's our job and our responsibility because God has laid it on us. Jesus told us before he left, our job is to make disciples. What he means is go tell the story. And you hear me tell that a lot from the pulpit because I believe we are kingdom builders. And the way we build that kingdom is by telling his story. Because nobody's going to escape him in the end. You can avoid the question. You can delay the question. You can postpone it or stonewall it. You can pretend that you never heard it. But sooner or later, you're going to have to answer it. Because we're all going to see Jesus at some point. And I want everybody I know, even those I don't know, because God loves every person he's created. And think if it was your child. How much do you love your child? Don't you want to be with them forever? Or more importantly, don't you want them to be with Jesus forever? And so we've got children, some our own, that, that maybe cannot affirmatively answer this question. So I hope if you have children in that situation, you're praying and asking God, put some godly people around my daughter or my son. Because I'm not there. And help them to turn their eyes to you, not to the world. Across the centuries, discussion has continued about who is this Jesus. Is he a good man? Is he a prophet? Was he really born with, of a virgin? There's no way that could have happened. And nobody comes back to life after death. And we're still talking about it this morning. And the talk and the story and conversation must continue. You see, after 2,000 years, some still believe he was just a good man or a misunderstood teacher or, or some deluded Jesus freak. The fabrication of our early church was all dependent on the fact that all those people knew who Jesus was, that they knew he was the Son of God, and it was a mystery we couldn't understand, but we had the faith that it was the truth. And that is all God asks of us, is to believe what he has told us in this book. We don't have to understand that mystery. That glass will clear up later on. Of the 105 words in the creed, have you ever noticed what the bulk of it's about? 
There's 105 words in that creed. 65 words of the 105 occur in that section referring about Jesus. What do you think is important in that creed? That tells us something. It tells me that the Christian faith is all about Jesus, that he is the heart and the core of our faith. He is the touchstone of all that we believe and how we live our lives and how we treat others and how we build his kingdom. Friends, you can be mistaken on a lot of secondary issues that are in this book and still be a, a Christian. But if you're wrong about Jesus, you are wrong in the worst possible place. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, born of a virgin Mary. Jesus, first it's important to remember that when we say Jesus, we're, we're, we've, we've said a mouthful. Jesus is fully human and he's fully divine. And he's the only one that can say that. There are no other humans in this world. If they are and you've met them, I would like to know about it. There are no other humans in this world that were born to a virgin and was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the only one. And Jesus is the only one that's a part of the Trinity that was born of a human. So he is truly human and truly divine. And these are not just preachy words for Sunday morning. You have to believe this about Jesus. You have to own this fact about Jesus. And even if you're never going to understand how that could happen until that glass is clear, it's got to be a part of who you are. I believe in Jesus. Jesus is our Lord's proper name. It's kind of like Beverly or David. It identifies him also as a historical person and not just some pious figment of someone's imagination. Jesus is the Greek version of the Hebrew word yeso, which means God saves. That is what Jesus means. God saves. It is true that the name Jesus speaks to Christ's work also, but the name Jesus reminds us of his full humanity. And so it's really a little bit of difference when we say Jesus or we say Christ, and that's why most of the time I say Jesus Christ, because, because that wraps it all up. But because Jesus is fully human, in Hebrews 4, we, write that Je we read that Jesus is able um, to sympathize with all of our weaknesses. That means that when you are grieving and in pain, this human that walked this earth, he understands. He's been there. Jesus was truly human, but he never sinned. That's the difference in him and us. And as truly human, Jesus experienced and expressed a range of human emotion. When John writes of Jesus' soul and spirit being troubled uh, in John 12, he says, Jesus says, now my soul is troubled. John didn't just make that up. Those were the words of Christ. His soul was troubled. And he chooses, John chose a Greek word for that word troubled that's often used by people when they are anxious or they are surprised by danger. That's a troubled soul. That is a troubled soul. Uh, I don't know that I've ever been surprised by danger. Maybe I have and God just erased it from my memory so I wouldn't have nightmares. I don't know. But, but Jesus was anxious. Can you, um, can, you, can you, I have a hard time thinking of Jesus as having anxiety issues. <laughs> just like me. It's, it's, but he's human. So yes, he did. He was anxious by stuff like me, but he was surprised by danger. Jesus also marveled at the faith of the centurion that we read about in Matthew 8. Matthew writes, when Jesus heard him, he was amazed, and he said to those who followed him, Jesus said, truly I tell you, 
In no one in Israel have I found such faith as I have found in this centurion. Jesus was surprised. He marveled. He was in awe. He was human. And we all know the famous shortest verse of the Bible, he wept. He wept. How many of us have cried before? Jesus did it. It's okay. When his friend Lazarus in chapter 11, when he found out he had died, and he went to, to Martha and, and Mary and said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And they took him. And when Jesus got to the, to the grave, he wept. He started to cry. Because he's just like you and I. I had a funeral yesterday afternoon. And we stood by the graveside and we wept. Because we're human. And there, for me, is comfort knowing that Jesus was truly human. And Jesus experienced the fears and the anxiety and the grief that I have experienced in my life because he's human. And that makes him just a little more relatable to me. I hope so for you. That he knows and he understands what we're going through right now. Whether we tell anybody or not, he knows. And he knows our fears and he knows our anxiety. And he is here and has sent the Holy Spirit to give us his peace and his hope. There's going to be a better day. And second, Christ is fully divine. That goes on to say, I believe in Jesus Christ. While the name Jesus refers to his true humanity, the name Christ refers to his full divinity. In, in Greek, the word Christ is, is the word for the Hebrew word Messiah. That's the divine part of Jesus. Jesus is the human part. Christ is the Messiah. There's the divinity. Messiah means the anointed one. He was God's anointed and chosen Messiah. He's not only true human, he's also fully divine. And there's also comfort and assurance in remembering that Jesus is fully divine. He is, if your hymn books are open, you don't need to open them, but if you look on page 880, right beside of our Apostles' Creed, it's the Nicene Creed. And about eight lines down in that Nicene Creed, we read, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance, homosis with the Father. Psalm 35, 9 tells us that for he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. Jesus took his disciples on a retreat one day to Caesarea, Caesarea Philippi. And this was a place where people had all kinds of pagan gods. And, and they didn't mind God, the, our Father, being a part of that. They didn't mind adding Jesus to all those pagan gods. But they weren't going, they couldn't believe in just one God. So they, they had to keep all of their false gods there. And Jesus had this famous conversation with his disciples there. He says, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And in Matthew 16, the disciples answered him, and, and they said, well, some say you're John the Baptist, and some say that you're Elijah, and, and some say that you're a prophet, Jeremiah, and, and, or some of the others. And Jesus let them know right quick, he didn't care what everybody else thought. That wasn't, that wasn't important to him, really. What he wanted to know, what do you, what do you, who do you think I am? And so Simon Peter quickly answered, you know, he, he's real uh, knee-jerk, kind of like your pastor, and, and he just jumps into it, and he says, you're the Messiah. You are the Son of God. Who do you say he is? When I say that I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, I am personally affirming the deity of Jesus Christ. 
And I think that's absolutely essential for all of us. When we say that line in the Apostles' Creed, we have to remember we're affirming his humanity, but more so we're affirming his divinity. And I hope that, that today we understand that in his humanity, he knows everything we're going through, and in his full divinity, he's got it all under control. Amen? Praise and glorify and honor his holy name. Friends, I ask you to please keep telling the old, old story of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Somebody needs to hear that. Maybe today, ask God for an opportunity to be put in your life so that you can tell somebody that's struggling, that's on the line, <coughs> or maybe doesn't know who this Jesus Christ is. And if you can't remember, go back to the creed. I know you all know it by heart. And that's all you have to say. As Christians, we believe in God the Father. Da 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 da. We know it all. Let us stand right now and let us affirm our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed found on page 881. <clears throat> I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was the Son of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under conscious power, was crucified, died, and buried. A month or day, he rose from the dead. He is ascended to heaven, and sitting at the right hand of God the Father. Yes.
the I'm going to ask, ask this man right here to be with me. I was going to ask my husband to, he's going to cut it up. We're done. Turn it off.